Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. 2010, the economy has grown by about 2% per annum. In 2016, it grew at 1.6%. In Q1, as you mentioned, 2017, it grew at 0.7%. And now we have a rollover in auto loans, distress in credit cards, student loans, and auto loans in the banking system, and 98,000 net new jobs in March. We'll find out on, on Friday what the number is for April. But uh, if you look at the ISM manufacturing and service sector reports, both those components point to weakness in employment. So uh, I don't think the Fed is looking at data. I think the Fed is lying. I use that uh, word very deliberately. They're being mendacious because they have no other choice. They've taken the Fed's balance sheet from $800 billion in 2007 to $4.5 trillion. They left interest rates below 1% for 100 months in a row. And all they can engender is GDP growth with a zero handle. So if they came out and said, well, we really uh, don't want to hike rates anymore. The economy is, looks a little wobbly over here. We got to start thinking about uh, reducing interest rates. There would be absolute panic in Wall Street. So the reason what the, the, why they came out and said yesterday that they believe the economy had a weak patch, but it's transitory, even though a retarded amoeba would understand that that's a lie. We've had eight years of weak patches. It's not a patch. This is something that is pervasive. It is something that's permanent. The economy is debt disabled and an asset bubble ridden, and it's due to the hollowing out of the middle class by the Federal Reserve. So it is not transitory. The Fed has to pretend it is and hope and pray that the economy turns around. But I can tell you, I believe, unfortunately, it will not until we have a massive deleveraging in the economy and we pare down these asset bubbles to a level that can be sustained by the free market. When they meet in uh, June, do you think at that point they will raise the interest rates one, once again? Or do, or do you think they'll just keep them steady or maybe even decrease them? Well, I, I don't think they're going to decrease them. I, I, you know, you have to ask me closer to June. I think they want to raise rates in June. I think they're planning to raise rates in June, but the data probably won't allow them to raise rates in June. If we have a bad non-farm payroll print, and if we have another quarter that looks like Q1, there isn't a chance they can raise interest rates. Now, they won't raise interest rates in June if that's the case, but they will still come out and tell the investing public that the economic growth trajectory is positive and that everything's on track because there's nothing else they can do. If the, if the economy rolls over now, and I have every reason to believe it will, you look at a massive distress now that's starting to unravel in China, and China was responsible for 30% of all global growth since 2007. Everybody's talking about this huge turnaround in earnings growth that we've seen. We haven't seen any growth, any real growth in earnings for the past three years. The stock market is up. The S&P 500 is up 30%. But the actual level of EPS, the level of S&P 500 earnings per share, hasn't really changed in the past three years. What you hear from Wall Street is a good comparison from Q1 2017, year over year, Q1 2016. That's because we had a massive plunge in oil prices. 
just before Q1 2016. So year over year, earnings look good. But if you look at the level of earnings, the actual level of earnings trailing 12 months, 2000, Q1 2017 to Q1 2015, haven't gone anywhere. It's virtually the same level. So there's no earnings rebound. We just talked about there's no GDP rebound. The reason for that is not because the taxes are too high, although I love low taxes, as long as you can reduce them without blowing up the deficit, you have to cut spending too. But the reason why the economy can't grow is because we are a debt disabled economy that is uh, sucking off the, uh, well, I don't want to get vulgar, but <laughs> I was going to get vulgar, but I won't <laughs> say it, but Janet Yellen's 100 months of free money, that is exactly what's keeping this economy uh, depressed. We have to allow interest rates to rise to a normal level that will burst the asset bubbles that are extent in stocks, bonds, and real estate. The rising of interest rates will also enable us to pare down all of the debt that we've accumulated, which by the way, in the United States will be 105% of GDP and a record total debt that's public and private debt, a record 350% of GDP. Now, you said something, raising the rates, you said is going to pop the housing market bubble. It's going to pop the asset bubble. So what you're saying is what the Fed is doing is it's not going to help the economy? In the law, it's all about duration. So if the Fed were, was allowed to or believed that they really need to normalize interest rates, so we should have a real interest rate of around 2%. So if you have 2%, Inflation, you have 2% re, uh, uh, real growth, 2% um, uh, real interest rates, that's 4%. The Fed was to take the Fed funds rate to 4%. That would, in the short term, bring about a, a depression in the United States. But that's exactly what we need. I want to be very clear. I, uh, we want to get to a situation that's sustainable and viable in this country. We, re we really don't want to grow a nation by making sure we have debt that's growing four times GDP growth like they have in China. We don't want to have a nation that's living off artificial interest rates and asset bubbles and the hollowing out of the middle class. That's the real reason why Trump won the election. You know, it, yes, it has something to do also with our trade uh, deficits, but what about the fact that we have a middle class that's losing its purchasing power with its money for decades? That's the real issue. We need to bring real earnings and productivity back to the United States, and that has to become a function of the removal of this artificially low interest rate uh, spectrum and also the asset bubbles that are extent, the triumvirate of asset bubbles that are extent today. Do you think that we're in a recession right now? Well, I think that the economy is in contraction. If you look at the first quarter, if you actually – were to deflate the GDP number by a real inflation rate, and absolutely the economy's in contraction. You know, you know, we have something called tax receipts that the government takes in. Corporations have paid 18% less in taxes in the six months of 2000, fiscal 2017 over fiscal 2016. Now there has been, as far as I know, no change in tax policy that's been passed into law. So what would account for an 18% drop in corporate tax receipts paid to the government? Well, you know, would that happen in a booming economy? No, it would not. The economy is not falling off the cliff, but certainly in my view, already in contraction. And if you deflate that 0.7% by a real inflation figure, not the, the massaged core PCE deflator that the Fed uses and the BEA uses, Bureau of Economic Analysis, and clearly the economy is not growing. It is shrinking. So do you think the, the market or the bond market, are they ripe to come crashing down? Well, I think the bond yields in the short term will come crashing down. And I think on the other side of this recession, after the stock market implodes and yields fall and bond prices rise, I think the response to that phenomenon will be helicopter money and massive deficits, which will eventually explode the bond market. Yields will soar. In fact, I wrote a book about it, about it called The Coming Bond Market Collapse. But you can't be a stop clock and say, always buy gold, always short bonds, always do anything. You have to have a model 
that looks at this dynamic between inflation and deflation, which is exactly what I do, realize what the government is doing. Either they're deflating on the, uh, on the uh, debt, trying to inflate it away, or they're trying to deflate the debt away by, by normalizing interest rates. Look at that dynamic, and in that way, you can best allocate your portfolio. Now, with the Fed raising rates, this reminds me of 2000, actually prior to 2008, where they started to raise the rates slowly and then things started to fall apart. The real estate market started to fall apart and then all of a sudden they started to reverse it. Are they trying? I mean, is this what they're trying to do right now? Because it reminds me exactly what happened back then. So from 2003 to 2004, the Fed funds rate was 1%, which helped engender the housing bubble. And then from 2004 to the summer of 2006, Mr. Bernanke started to raise the rates from 1% to 5.25%. By the time he got to 5.25% in the uh, summer of 2016, the yield curve completely inverted. First it flattened out, then it inverted. And it was about another year after that, we saw a complete implosion of the housing market, the economy in the United States, and indeed the entire financial system across the globe. So that's what I think is going to happen again. You know, the Fed, that's what the Fed does. That's their MO, their modus operandi. They blow up asset bubbles. Then they try to normalize interest rates. They realize they can't do that because of the massive amount of debt accumulation, and nothing compares to that in history like we have today. So when they took rates from, from five and a quarter back to zero or to zero, not even back to zero. They never the record low interest rates reached zero by the end of 2008, and again they've been below one percent or below for 100 months. There were only one percent for 12 months that led to the crisis, the financial crisis. Now they're one percent or less for 100 months. So uh, this crisis has engendered. This coming crisis will be engendered by a incredible increase, a massive increase in global debt. You can throw China, Japan, and Europe. We have a sovereign debt bubble like we've never seen below, before. And since you have a sovereign debt bubble, you know all assets are geared off that risk-free rate of return. So you have bubbles in, in equities across the globe, in bonds, and in real estate. And they are the product of a huge increase of leverage. And that's why interest rates can never normalize. But that normalization is part of the healing process. You know, if we allowed interest rates to go to five and a quarter in 2008, I'm sorry, in 2006, and allowed the housing bubble to crack and the stock bubble to pop, but we didn't take those rates down to 0%, we would let let the free market decide interest rates. We would have a viable, healthy economy. We would have had a massive depression maybe two, three years in duration. But then we would have stable interest rates, a stable currency, uh, stable taxes, stable inflation. All those things would have been, and, 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 and growing real wages and no asset bubbles. We, see, the, the rise in rates is the market's way of fixing the problem, but that's not being allowed right now. But if we allowed that process to consummate, that's the recipe for, for growth. But we have to suffer first. And the suffering, you know, it's just like a heroin addict. You have to go through the withdrawal, and then you have peace. We have to have that withdrawal first. We're not, we're not having it yet. But if we, ha- if we have one, I'm, I'm afraid that if we start having another uh, global crisis, and I'm, I'm quite convinced, unfortunately, that it's unav- uh, unavoidable, completely inevitable to have one, the response to that isn't going to be, hmm, The Federal Reserve isn't going to say, and the government isn't going to say, we learned our lesson. Debt, deficits, asset bubbles, artificial interest rates didn't work. Let's let the free market rectify the imbalances. Instead of reaching that conclusion, the conclusion is going to be from Ms. Yellen. She's still around. We, like 1937, we, the Federal Reserve, made a mistake and tightened too quickly. And the answer is go back to zero, go back to QE, start helicopter money, and everything's going to be fine. And what a massive opportunity that is for investors because that, that's when my model will switch from a deflationary hedge to an inflationary hedge and hopefully will make a lot of money for our investors. 
So while this is happening, what happens to people's uh, savings, their pensions, their investments, the multiple homes that they're purchasing now? Well, they get wiped. I mean, Dave, they get wiped out like they did in 2008. Uh, there's no avoiding that. I mean, you want to, you know, want to top tick Tesla and Facebook and Amazon and Google and Netflix. I think if you look at those five companies, they account for 50 percent of the entire market cap of the S of the uh, Nasdaq 100. Five companies, 50 percent of the market cap. I mean, people are all crowded into. These big names, they've all piled into passive management strategies. They've all piled into ETFs because the notion is that the Fed will always have you back. And if the Fed doesn't have your back, Donald Trump's going to pass this massive, miraculous tax cut that even though it possibly blows up the deficit, by the way, deficits are already headed to a trillion dollars per annum in the next few years, 1.4 trillion by 2026. That's without a recession and that's without any tax cuts. Imagine if we have an unpaid for tax cut. Do you know what happens to the long bond? The long bond is going to soar in, in yield and it's going to collapse this over leveraged economy. No matter what benefit there is from taking a corporate tax down rate down from 35 to 20. If he even gets there, he probably can't get there without uh, eliminating massive deductions, which aren't going to happen. So maybe you get a corporate tax rate from 35 to 28. They don't eliminate any deductions. It's sort of something that happens in 2018, doesn't really affect the economy. In the meantime, if you look what's going on with the price of oil, oil's down 4%, copper's plunging, commodities are rolling over, auto loans are rolling over. Uh, as I, we talked about GDP and the, and the productivity, bending down towards negative. Uh, so actually, the productivity in Q1 was negative. So uh, this is not a very good scenario for the Fed to like aggressively start hiking interest rates. So. So, um, you know, you can put your head in the sand and behave and, and behave like the Fed has solved all of our problems and now they can normalize interest rates with impunity. I would bet against that. So with everything rolling over and the economy getting worse and the only thing that's up is the stock market, Trump, you know, pushing the idea that he's going to be bringing manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. They just passed a one trillion dollar spending bill that's going to bring the government up until what's October 1st or so. October, yeah, September 30th. Yeah. I mean, is this going to help the economy? I mean, can he really change it around? Let, let's see what happened in that. Uh, it's called the omnibus spending bill. So it keeps the government funded until September 30th. But what did that bill do? It's over a trillion dollars in additional spending, $21 billion for increased military. This is an increase military spending, not total. The increase in military spending for the Republicans was $21 billion. Democrats got $5 billion for a uh, bailout of Puerto Rico and Planned Parenthood funding. Where was the cuts, Dave? No, here's what here's the, here's what gets me more than anything, and I'm going to write about this next week. Is that you know when Obama was president and deficits 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 and debt doubled, so we doubled from we went from just under 10 trillion to almost 20 trillion dollars in national debt. Republicans were the party of fiscal rescue. They claimed that blowing up blowing up these budgets deficits and adding to the national debt was anathema. Now they're in power. All they want to do is spend without all, any offsetting uh, 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 factors, nothing. They don't want to cut spending and they don't want to eliminate any deductions with this tax plan. Really, it's very, very, very sad. So they're both, both these parties, once this bread and circuses, both parties want to spend money. That's exactly what they do best. That's what they've done historically. And it looks like that's exactly what we're going to get from Mr. Trump. How much longer do you think we're going to last with this economy right now? I mean, will we make it until the fall or do you see it breaking apart before that or after? I believe it's unraveling as we speak. As we speak, it's unraveling. So the Fed, ha the, just to be specific, the Fed ended quantitative, quantitative easing. They started to, to taper the asset purchases in 2013. They ended in 2014. That was when the tightening cycle start, started. They started raising rates. They did it. They've done it all the way from zero to 25 basis points to uh, 75 to 100 basis points. So they've tightened uh, two times: once in December 2016, and once in um, in March of 2017. Before that, they the first tightening cycle was a certain, first one was December of 2015. So they raised raised a total of three times. 
after they stopped the quantitative easing program. So the Fed has been tightening monetary policy for, for several years already, and they are supposed to hike rates in June. And as they're hiking rates, I'm looking at the economy bending over, rolling over hard. I'm looking at commodity prices rolling over hard. I'm looking at employment figures rolling over. I'm looking at productivity rolling over. I'm looking at China rolling over. I'm looking at credit card, student loan, and auto loan defaults rising. And into all this, the Fed is talking about not only raising rates in June, but talking about the eventual draining of its $4.5 trillion balance sheet. That means selling mortgage-backed securities and treasuries, longer dated assets that they hold, not just Fed funds, which is you know basically treasury bills. They're selling their four and a half trillion dollar hoard of longer dated treasuries and mortgage backed securities. Now in that scenario, I don't see a possibility of the market holding serve here throughout the summer. The House is supposed to pass the repeal of the of, of Obamacare, the ACA. Um and if they don't get that, I think the market uh, really rolls over. You know, when I hang as I hang up the phone. But assuming that passes, then it has to go to the Senate. Then it has to go into reconciliation and then be voted again. And that's just the Affordable Care Act repeal and replacement bill. That's not the same as tax cuts. The market, the stock market, is clinging to one thing: massive, unadulterated tax cuts, not tax reform. The market is clinging to massive tax cuts to stimulate economic growth and is not at all concerned about deficits. That is what the market is clinging to. But between now and when that finally gets passed, again, the Affordable Care Act passage is not the same as the passage of tax reform. Totally different. Tax reform is going to take many, many, many months to even come up with a bill. So we're talking about 2018, in my opinion late 2017, early 2018. So between then and now, there's just an air pocket for the stock market to hit. No good news, only a continuing deterioration of US and global economic growth. And that I, that I think is very problematic for investors who have a record amount of NYSE margin debt and who believe that the stock market can never go down because they had the Fed put backed by a Trump put. I think both those things are going away this summer. Michael, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? So it's at pentaport.com, and my email address is mpento at pentaport.com, and the phone number here for the office is 732-772-9500. Okay, thank you very much for being on the Spotlight. I really appreciate it. Thank you.